Everywhere we turn, we feel an overwhelming sense of uncertainty. So many voices, so many opinions, so many ways we can go. Is there a clear path? How do we find it? How can we hear God's voice above all the noise? As followers of Jesus, we are to be set apart. We're in the world, but we're not on the path of the world. God doesn't just see where the road goes, He paves the road. He knows what lies beyond every bend in our lives. Jesus is the way, and His Word is the guide. Well, we have started our series last week on America, and um, if you missed last week, I, I want to strongly encourage you <clears throat> to go back to our website and, and listen to that message, because that is the foundation, that is the heartbeat, it's the nucleus of all the other messages that we are going to share about and talk about as a community of believers. So I want to I want to encourage you to to do that. Take the time to do that, um, and um, I think then we will all be on the same page. Because everywhere we turn, we feel overtaxed in our society by uncertainty. I mean, there there are so many opinions that are out there both in the church and outside the church, relating to a variety of topics that are biblical and not biblical. And there's so many voices in the day and age that we live, we can listen to so many podcasts, so many speakers, so, so much information that is true and false that is out there, and, and, and there's so many different ideologies that we can believe in. The question we face is, is there actually a clear path when it comes to truth? I mean, if so, how do we find it? How do we find it? I mean, even Pilate, when he was with Christ before Christ was going to go to the cross, and Jesus was standing before him, truth in the flesh. And, and, and Pilate confused, because then just as now, so many different ideologies going around, so many different opinions, so many different thoughts, and he stands in front of Jesus. And as Jesus claims that he's truth, Pilate's response, sarcastically, is what, what is truth? What is truth? I mean, because he, couldn't, he could not figure out what was true. I think we're there. But when we find it, how do we then navigate our way? How do we hear God's voice above all the noise? As, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are set apart. The Bible says that. Not in an elite type of way. Remember, Jesus said, I came to this earth not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for others. We are in the world for a purpose, but we are not of the world. And, and God, God doesn't just see uh, where the road goes in life. He will pave the way for us. He says, I am the way, the truth, I am the life. I am the light of the world. And so, so, it's hard at times if we're not sound biblically, if we don't understand and get into the word of God ourselves. but we listen to so many different opinions, it brings confusion. 
Because we begin as a church and not just river of life. The church of Jesus Christ is starting to listen to man more than he listens to God. Because we're lazy. We want everything fed to us. We don't want to take the time to study the word. We don't want to take the time to, to, to pour our heart out to Christ and say, God, give me wisdom. Give me knowledge as the book of James says. And Jesus says, if you will just ask, I will give you truth. I will give you wisdom. He paves the way. Church's word is the answer to hard questions. We saw last week that as we begin to talk about all these things, that we have to remember that this is personal. This is not about the person sitting next to you, your friend, your spouse, your group, the people you hang out with the most. Everything that we talk about is personal. It's about you. It's about me. And we saw last time, and that's why it's so important that we go back and, and listen to this message as, an, as a whole, because I, I, I definitely don't have time to, to give a good recap of the book of Isaiah that we looked at, Isaiah 5 and 6. But we saw that Isaiah was confused. He allowed his emotions to override his convictions. He began to trust in himself and in man for God to do something in, in, in the land that he lived in. And the Holy Spirit had to, to touch his heart with the coal of fire, if you will, that we talked about. And once that happened, there was change in Isaiah personally. And he realized what he didn't realize before when he was giving a prophecy. It's literally amazing. And so, so this is personal. It's personal when we talk about sexuality. It's personal when we talk about prejudice and racism. It's going to be personal when we talk about what is authority? What is true authority? What is biblical authority? It is, it is going to be personal when we talk about sanctity of life and abortion. Well, it's going to be personal when we talk about the unity of a believer and what the Bible really says about unity. It, it's going to be and needs to be personal when we talk about how to be in the world but not consumed by the world's lore. And lose focus on the great commission and, and, and the commandments that God has given us in his word. It's going to be personal when we talk about how is God and, and his word, how does that, that mix in with politics and government? Not just in the United States. We're not the only government. So, so it's as a whole. And it has to be personal. If it's not personal, we are not going to, to really grasp what God is trying to tell us through his word. Because we're going to be pointing the finger at everybody else. I'm well aware that, that we're going to talk about a lot of things that probably everyone in this room and everyone who hears online is, is not going to agree with. And that's okay. But I want us to, to love one another. If you have a question, a concern, please don't go into your own groups and start talking about it. I'm asking you out of respect and out of unity to come to me and have an appointment with me. And after that meeting, we may still disagree, but I guarantee you, that I will respect you, your opinion, I will love you, and we can continue to pray together about what God says in his word. Amen. So I'm gonna ask you that. We're gonna have multiple speakers. I'm gonna close the message, the, the series. 
But this is, this is what the Lord has put on our hearts. Our, our team, our pastors have fasted. We have prayed, we have, we have studied, we have done our due diligence. But we're human beings. We don't have the market on the word of God. I don't believe anybody does. And that's why we have to keep studying to show ourselves approved. That's why we need to keep walking in humility to say, God, please teach me, show me. As I said, Isaiah, the greatest, the most religious, the most, um, he was the greatest man of God on the earth at the time. And his attitude was wrong. And God had to, to come in and, and touch his heart and say, hey, you've allowed all the noise to, to go another direction and you're not on the road I want you. I need to have you open your heart and get back in right alignment with me. Martin Luther said this, if you preach the gospel in all aspects, with the exception of the issues that deal specifically with your time, you are not preaching the gospel. So in our day, human sexuality is the issue of our time, especially as it relates to homosexuality, the LGBTQIA plus movement, what has taken place not just in America, but all around the world. And I want this to stick in your mind as we go through this. Our identity is greater than our sexuality. Because our identity is in Christ Jesus. And so as we walk through this, I just want you to, I'll say this phrase several times. And I want you to know when I say our identity, God says, you are my son, you are my daughter, you are more than a conqueror, you are a masterpiece that I am continuing to create and develop until I see you face to face. So our identity, if we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, is in him. Okay, so let's, when I say that, that's what I mean by identity. So, what is the Bible's perspective? What do you see? What happens in your heart when you see two men together, two women together, when you see something, on, when you see uh, discussions on transgender, when you see what is happening um, in our society, what is happening in, our, in, in churches all over the nation where they are... <clears throat> Churches are now accepting um, the identity sex sexually as, as truth, that, that it is okay, and also using God's word to justify it. So, so what, do you, what, what happens in you when these topics are brought up? Now, we're, we're focusing on sexuality today. Law sees the sin Grace sees the sinner. Why is this such a difficult topic for the church? Maybe some of us fear being looked at as a bigot. Maybe we approach the topic with a self-righteous attitude so our motivation is automatically wrong. We don't have the heart of God. Maybe we just feel everyone needs to be happy. And if they're happy, they're happy. And it doesn't bother me and my life, so who cares? And, and then many of us handle this like we do with issues we don't want to actually face. We don't actually want to look into it. And, and we don't want it to affect our own life. So then what do we do? We ignore it. Well, I believe we need to start somewhere as we dive into this using the word of God as our base. So let's look at God's original design for human sexuality and relationships. So the first is a thing we, we need to, to, to come down to with the root of all this is what was God's design? What is God's original design? 
So in Genesis chapter 1, God creates humanity and gives them two responsibilities, ruling the earth and reproducing to enable the sustaining of that reign. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves across the earth. And then in Genesis 2, and I don't have time to really dive into all of Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, and I want you to continue to do your homework, but in Genesis chapter 2 now, it highlights for us the difference between the sexes. And and Adam was created first in verse seven of chapter two, but he is alone. And it says it is not good for him to be alone. Now, not good in the sense that he is single. So that's not what it means. Because obviously we see those in the Bible who were single and had a full and wonderful and productive life in Christ Jesus. Paul, Mary I can, of Bethany, John the Baptist, Martha, Jesus, I, I mean Jesus. <laughs> and I can go on and on and on. So, so in this situation, Adam cannot fulfill the purpose for which God first created him. Are you following me? Multiply and fill the earth. Every animal God brings him, he names and he does, as he does this, he is aware that they have partners and you see in Genesis 2, 21, so the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man Then the man said, this at last is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. So she is like him in the right way in that she's human. She's also unlike him in the right way. And this leads to a unique unity when they come together physically. So so the physical union symbolizes the spiritual union that God enacted by the way of marriage. The purpose then of a biblical marriage and marital sex is to become one and to generate life, to express and deepen the unity between both of them. In Genesis 2, 24, it says, Therefore then, because this is true, man shall leave his father and also his mother, hold fast to his wife, watch this, and they shall now become one flesh. When it talks about one flesh, this is a spiritual, there is a spiritual dimension, a spiritual realm to what is being written in Genesis. In other words, God is involved. Do you see it? God is involved. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 6, Jesus echoes what was written back in Genesis, and he says this. So they, speaking of a man and a woman, are no longer two because now they've come together in this union. They have come together spiritually but also physically. So they're no longer two but one flesh. Now watch this. What therefore God, who? God has joined together out of purity, out of his word. He is the word, right? Right? God has joined together, let no one, let man not separate. So so God's active in the process. Why? Because it's his design. It's not man's design. It's not a law that a government makes. It's God's design. Marriage is based on gender. Matthew 19, verse 5. Therefore, a man again shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. 
it's the difference that accounts for the depth of the union between a man and a woman. A, a homosexual relationship can have a union, but it's not the kind of union that we have been discussing in Genesis and is possible with a heterosexual marriage. Now, I'm not saying that a homosexual relationship doesn't have commitment. It, it can. I'm not saying that a homosexual relationship doesn't have faithfulness to its partner and loyalty to their partner because they do and they can but the issue in a biblical marriage is not the feelings of commitment that exists between two people. The issue is the union God gives to a man and a woman when they unite together. And a part of that is them physically becoming one because that is God's design. That's not of lust. That is not because I just want to have sex. It is God's design. Do you follow that? That's important. So secondly, God intended marriage to be then a reflection of our relationship, not with our spouse, but with him first. That's the design. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 31, Paul again puts it this way, therefore, and here's the third time this is mentioned, and if you've been at River of Life any amount of time, you know in, in historical and ancient text, when they write something over and over and over again, you need to pay attention and I need to pay attention because they do it out of repetition to say, do you get this? Do you see how important this is? So we see the writer of Genesis say it, we see Jesus say it, and now Paul says it. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Here, watch what Paul says. <laughs> this, this mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ. Why? Because it's God's design. And the church... And what is the church? People, right? So every Christian marriage is a reflection of Christ's relationship. Every marriage, let's take out the word Christian, every marriage should be a reflection of Christ's relationship to us, to the church, and a demonstration to the word of that relationship. So regardless of what society or our laws choose to reflect in their view of sexuality, in their view of marriage, in their view of image, of am I a boy or a girl, if I, if I feel when I'm 10 years old or 12 years old or 15 or 40 that it's, I, I'm, I'm confused, He has given us reasons here. He wants our identity to be in him first. To help us. God loves us. God cares for all people. And so God has given us definite reasons for showing us the pattern for marriage, which then gives us a foundation for understanding now all, all human sexuality. So, so our identity is greater than our sexuality. Why? Because our identity needs to be in Christ. If our identity is in Christ, knowing we are a son or a daughter in Christ, knowing we are more than a conqueror in Christ, knowing that we are made in his image, knowing that we are made by his design, his thinking, we take ourselves off of the throne and as pastor was singing today, put our trust in him. All of a sudden, all the noise, all the confusion, everything now starts filtering in to our identity in Christ Jesus who loves us, who died on the cross for us, who rose again for us, who, who wants to spend eternity with us he died for us third 
God's design is for us to be set free from sin. What does the Bible say about homosexuality? Well, it's not that the Bible is fixated on this subject as we are. But it does address it. And I need you to get this. Why does it address sexuality, all sexuality? And I don't need to go down the list of all the acronyms. But why does it address all of those things? Why is it not just right out there in your face? Because homosexuality is one of the many. Everyone say many. Many. One of the many sins that can affect us. Are you following me? So I want to look at a summary of the scripture in Genesis chapter 19 and Sodom and Gomorrah is dealing with many sins and, and, and there's a situation there with Lot and his family and, and God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because they would not repent, they would not turn to him. And our word sodomy from Genesis 19 comes from uh, the place that this all occurs um, in Sodom. So now... There have been some who suggest, theologians that suggest that Genesis chapter 19 has nothing to do with with, uh, homosexuality or identity and in sexual values. And the reason for Sodom's destruction, they say, was given in Ezekiel chapter 6 and verse 49, which I want you to see, where it says, behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom, speaking of the city, Sodom. She and her daughters had pride. And this is why, they, they say, well, this is why that it was destroyed. Pride, ha- uh, uh, she and her daughters had pride, excess food, there's gluttony, uh, prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and the needy. Now, all those are true that happened in Sodom and Gomorrah, which, which is not good. Yet, the New Testament, both in Jude and 2 Peter, clarifies what we do see in Genesis chapter 19, and, and the Old Testament is also very clear about this subject. Look, go to Jude 1 and verse 7, and it brings this up. Just as Sodom, again, what is referred to in Genesis 19, just as Sodom and Gomorrah, and also the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued un- natural desires serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. In Leviticus chapter 18 verse 20, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Now I know that other theologians and different people say that these are club verses like the church beats people over the head with these verses. It should not be and we're going to get to that in a minute, but we can't not just ignore these either. So in, in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13, if a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death and their blood will be upon them. Many have rendered Leviticus as archaic and out of date and out of touch with reality and society and referring to the ceremonial law in the Old Testament and perhaps a case uh, could be made uh, there if it was not for the fact that the New Testament writers are equally clear about homosexuality and our sexuality. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 24, it says, Therefore, God has gave them up. And this is talking about men and women who who are choosing to live life themselves, do what they want. They have lost their identity in who they were, who they are in Christ, in their sexuality. And it says, therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity. Does that mean God does not love them? Absolutely not. But he said, listen, if you want to do this, if you want to go this direction, I am still going to be here, but I need you to turn to me. To dis- and then it says, to the dishonoring of their bodies amongst themselves. 
In Romans chapter 1, verse 26, he goes on to say, For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. There was confusion about their sexuality, who they were, what they wanted to do, and, 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 and who they wanted to be. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and, rece and receiving in themselves the due penalty in their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God in this. So they took God out of their identity. God gave them up to the debased mind. And the mind is a powerful thing. To do what ought not to be done because it's God's design. There are two truths that come out of these verses. One, homosexual behavior is unnatural. You say, well, Dale, maybe to a heterosexual. Um, but the word natural and normal are used here do not describe what feels natural to us in our own emotions and what feels right to us but refers to what is natural in creation so there's a difference and then second sin distorts God's intent because again it's God's design so Paul points in Romans 1 Paul's point there is that our human nature has turned away from what God intended. And, and church, isn't that the heart of all sin? That's the heart of all sin. Notice the, the, the judgment here is giving us completely over to ourselves. Completely over to what we want, what we think is right. And the Bible says the heart is wicked above all things. Who can know it? Only God. So again, from week one, we have to allow God to touch our heart. This is personal. This is about us staying humble before the Lord. And saying, God, if you need to put a coal on my tongue, on my mouth, in my heart, in my life, because of pride, which is a sin, selfishness, envy, bitterness, because of lust, God, because I hold unforgiveness, because of greed, because of chemical addictions. Listen, our desire for things God has forbidden is a reflection on how sin has distorted our hearts rather than a reflection on how God has made us. That's important. We all have areas of struggle. Every single one in this room, especially the person who is speaking to you today, right now, Battle is the sin nature every day. The good news is we don't fight alone. The Spirit of God helps us to be overcomers, like I said in the beginning, because we are more than conquerors. When we are in Christ Jesus, God is continuing to make a masterpiece out of me, a masterpiece out of you. When we, like Isaiah, run into his presence, we then become more like Christ. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Paul says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Doesn't say the homosexual, the unrighteous. Again, all sin. We all fall short. And then he says, listen, because of all the noise that's out there in and outside of the church, do not be deceived. We already know that the Bible says there are many that are going to say on that day, Lord, Lord. Lord, I did miracles in your name. I preached in your name. I went on evangelism trips in your name. I went on mission trips. I went to church. I was in a life group. I did all this in your name. 
And Jesus says, you know, well, I, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know you. We did not really have that a relationship. You decided really to, to live your life and maybe you put Christian on your shirt, but you were not in relationship with me. Do you not know that, and I want to make that clear, when it says unrighteous, don't just, oh, the whole, we're talking about sexuality. No. But then he says, hey, in all the confusion, let's not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, or the greedy, or the drunken, drunkards, uh, the swindlers, the deceitful, are not going to be with me throughout eternity. I mean, these verses highlight three important, compl- uh, uh, three important con- uh, concepts. The first is this. Homosexual sin is serious. It leads to destruction. Now, before we all shout amen, we need to grasp the second truth. Homosexuality is not the only serious sin. Stealing, lying, adultery, sex outside of marriage, abusiveness from your mouth, slandering people, cheating, drunkenness, greed, gossiping in life groups, unforgiveness. Sex outside of marriage. Listen, homosexuality is not the scarlet letter where we just run away from people. It's not the unpardonable sin. The question becomes, do we see the sin or does the heart go deeper than that shallow pool and do we see the human being standing before us? Or on TV or the news and hearing stuff about sexuality. Our identity is greater than our sexuality. We know what Jesus said. The Bible says he was a friend of homosexuals and liars and gossipers. And people having sex outside of marriage. People who talk bad about people in their own homes. Because I guess that's different than the church. I don't know why we think it's safer there. He was a friend to people who treat, who cheat. He was a friend to people who are alcoholics. The Bible says he was a friend of sinners, all sinners. King David, sinner. Mary Magdalene, Mary Magdalene, a prostitute. Zacchaeus, a cheat and a swindler. Paul, a murderer. The thief on the cross. He was a sin. He was a savior to that sinner. He was a savior to me, a sinner. You, there is no one righteous, no, not one. We can't conclude in our minds or lead others to believe that homosexuality is worse than any other sin. But it's a sin nonetheless. But the Bible says I'm no longer a slave to sin. And that includes all sin as well. We can overcome sin, the Bible says. Our identity is greater than our sexuality. In 1 Corinthians 6, 11, <clears throat> Paul says, and such were some of you. He's speaking to the church. Some of you could not help yourself but talk about other people. Your, your mouth was running constantly. Some of you just couldn't help it. When you were stressed, you got drunk. So, some of you just couldn't help it. You're, you're, you're sleeping with everybody. 
Some of you couldn't help it that you were homosexual and you allowed that desire to, to go all the way and, and you're in a full relationship. But you were washed. You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Paul was talking to all sinners in the church. All things are lawful to me, but all things are helpful. All things are lawful to me, but I will not be dominated by anything. It's possible for someone who has practiced a life of pornography to stop. It is possible for somebody that just talked about people and had a cutting tongue to stop. It is possible for someone who is on drugs and alcohol to stop. It's possible for someone practicing a homosexual lifestyle to stop. That's not to say that any of those examples would be without temptation. Paul says, <clears throat> turn back to your former way of life in Christ Jesus. That's your identity. And if you've never experienced that identity, in him, no matter what the sin, the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will be redeemed and restored. And if you need Jesus Christ today, he is ready for you to be in relationship with him. So Paul says, turn back. Don't give in to your own desires or thinking. This, you say, well, Dale, this is who I am. I was made this way. Paul says, no, that mindset has eternal ramifications. Your identity is greater than your sexuality. Your identity is in Christ Jesus, or he wants it to be in him. You say, well, what if two people are faithful and committed to each other? Can I just say, that is not the litmus test to consider whether it is a godly relationship, whether that is homosexual or heterosexual. You can be faithful to a prostitute, but, but, but that doesn't make it right. You can meet him or her once a month and have sex, and you're committed day in and day, month after month. But that does not make it right. We can be sexually active with someone and care deeply about them and, and be committed to them only in all ways sexually. But, but if it is outside the bonds of marriage, it is sin. It's sin. And you, you, you say, well, what about Jesus not mentioning the sin of homosexuality? He must not then be against it. Well, in Mark chapter 7 and verse 20, it says, and he said, Jesus said this, what comes out of a person in their heart is what defiles them. Okay? From within, from inside, their mindset, out of the heart come evil thoughts, Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. This word here, sexual immorality, it's the word parnea in the Greek. It's a catch-all phrase for any sexual activity outside of a heterosexual marriage. Jesus' audience and the audience today reading the word of God would have been well aware that this reference includes homosexuality. It includes all forms of sexuality that are not in Christ that are not designed, as we talked about in the beginning, from the original design. We also see that in Matthew 19 and verse 9, the only alternative to a heterosexual marriage was celibacy. And if that's the case, that's fine. There's some rock stars that we saw who were single. 
We don't need sex to live. Matthew 19, 9, and I say to you, Jesus says, okay, we're going to go now this route. Whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. The disciples said to him, oh my goodness, if, if such a case of a man with his wife, it's better than for them not to get married. But Jesus said, not everyone can receive this saying. In other words, it's hard. But only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this, receive it. What's that mean? It's personal. It's between them and God. And it's personal but for us too. Jesus says, in their love for the Lord, marriage was not an option. In their love for relationship with Jesus Christ, they are going to push away their own desires and allow Christ to begin to work and change their heart. Even though that desire is still there, every day fight as we do with all sin, not to succumb to that sin. This is not easy. And, and I wish I could tell everyone who struggles with same-sex attraction that if you give your life to Jesus, that those desires will just be gone forever. I'm not going to say that because that's not always true. Just like any other sin. I'm not saying that the I'm not saying that the greatness of God's grace can't miraculously take that desire away because it can. We've seen, I've seen that happen with sexuality, with drugs, with, with, with alcohol, with any sin, any bondage. Miraculously, God can do it. But in my 30 years of ministry, in my 30 years of counseling, usually it comes through our trust. And we sang about that today. And humility in Christ. And through the, the discipline of allowing the Lord to walk with us day in and day out. In Lamentations 3.22 it says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. He's a merciful God. He knows what you're dealing with when it comes to sin. He knows what I'm dealing with when it comes to sin, all sin. And he's merciful. His mercies never end. Watch this. And he knows the struggle. He knows the struggle. That's why he says, hey, they're new every morning. Amen. Every morning we have to crucify the flesh. Every morning we have to get up and say, God, I cannot do this. My desires are too great. God, I need you to help me. I need you to, I need you to restore me. I need your strength. I need your wisdom. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I would like to suggest that this is not unlike the battle that heterosexual single adults have who desire intimacy and the joy of sexual relationship yet have set all that aside for the purpose of honoring God with their body until he would provide someone for them for life and that someone may have never came. And that's okay when we're in Christ. Listen, it's not a sentence to a barren life. People have gone on to live out very fulfilling, powerful, purposeful lives in the Lord, fighting their sin nature and not giving in to that sin nature. Because our identity is in Christ. 
It's not in our sexuality. Listen, it's not a sin to experience same-sex attraction. It's not a sin to experience same-sex attraction any more than you would have an opposite-sex attraction or have a passing thought in your mind even though you're married. The Bible lets us know it doesn't become sin until we begin to entertain it habitually. Continue to think upon it and think upon it, lust after it, after it, and then eventually act on it. Temptation is a part of life. I mean, even Jesus was tempted. Wrong feelings in all of our hearts reminds us why we need Jesus. And that's why for God so loved the world that he gave us salvation. He gave us the answer. He gave us freedom from sin through Jesus Christ on the cross. Church, we can't be led by our emotions and our feelings. We cannot be led by the, 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 the thinking of the world. No, no matter how strong it is. We must be led by our convictions based on the word of God. Not our own convictions. Because then we get in trouble there too. Our convictions based on God's word. As a church, we love all people regardless of your background. Wherever you are in life, I want you to know you are welcome here. As your pastor, if you will have me. To fellowship, to hear the gospel. Hopefully to sense the love of Jesus through the people in this body. To grow in the love and understanding of the word of God and allow the spirit of God to continue to do his redeeming work in your life and also in my life. We can love people and be effective without affirming the sinfulness of someone's situation. The the. That's the greatness of grace. We are committed at River of Life to love people, to care for people, because that's who Jesus is. We are committed here at River of Life to be kind. Listen, if Jesus Christ was anything else on this earth when he walked it he was kind and before that didn't he say that before you ever knew him in all of your filth and all of your sin and all of your wickedness he says before you knew me I still loved you and we are to be imitators of Christ he was a friend of sinners I am a sinner only saved by grace the grace of God. I mean, maybe you're here and you're either homosexual or struggling with same-sex attraction. And if that is your area of temptation, first, I want to ask you for forgiveness. For the harshness, for the jokes, for the rude statements, for the sarcasm, for the way that some Christians have treated you. What you have heard through all the noise in our society from voices and spiritual voices that are out there that have said some pretty damning things which didn't come across too kind in my opinion. To make you feel that your struggle is unforgivable or to somehow that you're loveless by God. Or you're loveless 
that God loves me more than you or God loved Isaiah more than you. It's just not true. Second, I want you to know you matter to God. He loves you. Why? Because it's personal. It's personal. He cares for you. He died on the cross for you. And he has a plan for you just as much as he has a plan for me. Listen, you matter to this church. You matter to me and Angela, my wife, to our staff. You are welcome to this church to worship in the presence of God so that all of us might be transformed into his image. The greatness of grace is this, while we were yet sinners, he loved us. He loved Isaiah, again, the most religious man on the planet at that time, and he touched his heart. And he says, listen, I need to set you free from yourself. I love you and I have a plan for you. And if you're here this morning and you're struggling with your identity sexually, that's the subject matter today. God wants to take that coal, just like he did Isaiah, put it on your heart and say, hey, I care for you. I love you. Your sexuality does not define you. I want to define you. And I want to, I want you to live your life with me. And I am going to help you. I'm going to be there for you every day through this struggle because I love you.